Hey Outliers, we're back with David McDonough of Common Stock to dive into everything from his habits and routines to the tools he loves, his favorite books, and so much more, all in less than 20 minutes. Let's jump back in with David. David, welcome back to the second bonus portion of the interview. Thank you so much for the extra time. Of course, glad to be here. So just to build off, you know, I always like to ask some opening question that kind of connects this with the main interview. And we just spent almost an hour talking about common stock. So one, the kind of question I wanted to ask you is how has like being a part of common stock, being a part of that community, using that to follow other people, to share your investments, changed the way you think about investing or changed your investment returns? Just kind of insights there, I think would be really interesting. Yeah. In a multitude of different ways. There are, I can think of a few examples. It has given me exposure to assets and even asset classes that I didn't know existed. For me, a lot of it is discovery of certain crypto projects or equities or ways of thinking about the world. Thinking about Coinbase being underpriced because the market is worried about fee compression. Learning about Mike Maples, one of our investors, wrote a great article about Filecoin, which I had never previously known about. And it was interesting to dive into that. It's changed the frequency with which I transact. It's changed the way that I view my portfolio side by side, all the different asset classes, options, equities, ETFs, and crypto. Now seeing the discussion about NFTs, being able to stay, have a finger on the pulse of what people are buying and selling, seeing what's trending, seeing Dogecoin, right? This is, it's also given me a healthy dose of regret of, I bought Dogecoin way back in the day when Robinhood first decided to support it. I think I had a 100% return and sold it like three years ago. And then to watch Dogecoin go nuts earlier this year and see the data and see that what's trending has been really interesting. So just realizing like a big part of actual investing, whether it's professional or self-directed, is just being tapped into what the trends are, what markets are doing. A bunch of high quality data sources, which is always really hard to find. So now we'll transition into some of the questions just around kind of habits, routines, tools. And I'm curious, we haven't talked about this yet, but what does your daily routine look like? And are there things that you try to do that just help you show up as your best self? I think back to talking about that steep learning curve of being a CEO the mental side of the equation. I've always just noticed, at least for me, like habits and routines is something I've leaned into more when I'm in those stressful periods. <laughs> I will avoid going into like that. Well, I wake up at 4 a.m. and then I meditate for two hours. Yeah, you can leave that out. <laughs> I'll start and work backwards. One routine that's probably crazy that I do is I try to go for a two mile run every night. And I like running late at night just because running in the morning sounds crazy. You're not really loose. I grew up on the hill where there were so many tourists I had to run at night, but I found going for a run clears my head at the end of the day, like gets the endorphins moving. For some reason, I feel like I have a lot of my best ideas while I'm on a run, just being able to detach, being able to step away and see the larger picture. I read a lot of a few newsletters each morning. Basically, I wake up and I will try to triage via Twitter and a few email newsletters what's happening in the world what's happening in markets, what's happening in tech and VC world, and now crypto. And then nowadays, I'm actually in a lot more meetings. A year ago, I was in Figma doing design. I was reaching out to users. I was doing research. I was talking to creators. Now, a lot of what I do is my job has changed and I focus on the company org structure. I focus on our long-term strategy. And I focus on being the best spokesperson, recruiting, building the team. That's my new job. And a lot of it is just learning those new roles. Now I have more of a manager schedule where I don't get to design in Figma and build things myself. I still try to keep those skills fresh, but I'm no longer, I've been banned from actually doing any coding, which is probably for the best. That's probably a good place to be in the company. You mentioned newsletters. What newsletters do you follow and are there any you really enjoy? Honestly, the one that I've read since I started was Dan Primack back in the days when it was PE Hub and now at Axios. I think Axios has done a great job. He's a great writer. He's awesome. And so I try to read that every day. And then I try to not get too overloaded with newsletters and Twitter. Actually, one of the habits and routines is I actually kind of segment email responding. I think I try to avoid 
the pernicious trap of always feeling like you need to be on demand responding at all times, whether it's Slack or email, has created a actually less than productive approach. And I try to answer email in batches at the beginning of the day, middle of the day, if there's anything urgent, and then last thing at night. Along those lines, are there tools that you rely on? These can be physical tools. I mean, we talked about the amazing camera setup you have. This can also be software tools. What tools have you nerded out on or do you just really enjoy using? I nerd out on pretty much every productivity and tech gadget tool. Honestly, one of the more valuable has been I use Whoop to track my sleep and my heart rate. And again, this is a pretty long marathon of a job and making sure over time I can add some metrics like, am I getting enough sleep? Is my heart in a good spot? Just making sure I'm taking care of that baseline so that I can do my best work. I have an iPad Pro that I love taking notes on. And I also just hired, we just had an amazing chief of staff, Courtney, join. And we've been using something called Todoist, where we use an Eisenhower matrix, which is four quadrants. The top left, let's say, is urgent and important. The top right is important, not urgent. The bottom left is not important, but urgent. And you basically just, we whittle down just what we need to work on is in that urgent and important. And if it's in another quadrant, we either schedule it or give it to someone else to take care of. And so we've been using Todoist for that. And that's been unbelievable. That mixed with like this Eisenhower matrix approach to really prioritizing has been a huge unlock. And it's been exciting. Do you do the Eisenhower? Uh, yeah, I know that framework. We'll definitely link it in the show notes because I think it's a great reminder for anyone who needs a refresher. Do you guys do that via tags? Do you just go and triage and kind of move those into different categories? What's the system you use in Todoist? So we have four columns and the far left column is this sort of urgent to do and we are on the same dashboard. And the best part of my day is when I get to check something off as done. And then Courtney gets an alert that I've done something. And so it's like, boom, taking care of another thing. I'm not going to get in trouble for not finishing something I need to do. Because I think one of the challenges, not just as CEO, but as anyone at an early stage startup is understanding the difference between what feels like work, but is actually kind of just busy work and what is actually going to move the needle and move the company forward and making sure both for me as the CEO, but everybody on the team is at all times like asking themselves, is this the highest leverage, most important thing that I should be doing right now? If not, someone else should be doing it. And it's a constant battle just for myself, but also to remind the team to make sure you're doing that. Constant battle is the right word. How do you think about your superpowers? And I know that that may be a loaded term, but the idea is really all of us have things that we're just wired to do really well. And we also have things that we're wired to not be particularly great at. On the positive side of that coin, what do you feel like when you're doing it or when you hear from others, you're just performing at your highest level? What is a superpower for you? There are a few different ways to frame this. I think ultimately my superpower that I think of as a superpower, and I'm sure people would give me feedback otherwise, but for any founder or builder, I think empathy is the most critical unlock. It is like a secret weapon where if you have the right empathy, that skill to whether it's talking to an investor, talking to a user, talking to a customer, literally a partnership, being able to very quickly understand the pain points or the motivations or the incentives of the person you're talking with. And you're not manipulating them. It's just, I think for me, the way that I grew up, I kind of grew up in inner city DC and would go between a lot of different strata of social classes and the ability to understand, I think, really well understand different motivations and incentives and be able to just connect with people. Again, this isn't like you're trying to game the system. It's this person is incentivized by understanding how to improve their investments. If you have that empathy, which for me, it played out in being able to empathize with this mass of regular self-directed investors who were tired of being told they can't do this and wanted to learn and directly participate in capital markets, which is a great thing. That empathy showed me, whoa, there's a big market here. That empathy gave me the ability to talk to investors. It's frankly, empathy is a fancy way of just kind of talking about sales. Like anytime you need to close somebody, you just genuinely build a relationship with them and understand what makes them 
tick, what makes them happy. You don't need to be like the traditional boiler room salesperson. It's just, hey, I want to build rapport with you. I think you're interesting. Hopefully I can help you accomplish something. Here's what I think I can do to help you and tap into the drive of the person you're engaging with. That for me, from both product, fundraising, like anytime you jump into a fundraising conversation, understanding the motivations of the other person, what makes them tick, what they're excited about, and steering the conversation towards that is, I think, genuinely what I enjoy doing the most and has also been kind of the most valuable. I love that you brought up empathy. It hasn't been brought up before. And yeah, I think you're totally right. It's not a tactic, it's a state. And if I think about in my life, I think all of us want to build great relationships, not just with our significant other and the people that are really close with us, but the people we engage with every single day, the investors we bring on our cap table or the companies you invest in. And so I love that answer. On the flip side, what do you struggle with just personally and how have you gotten better at that over time? Or how do you kind of, I don't know, put checks and balances in place on yourself? What I struggle with, I think is a, this is a cop out, also a power, but like I've got so many ideas. I am your classic you have a gazillion ideas guy. Uh, you got to let me fly. I think that was a maybe Talladega Nights quote. <laughs> Will Ferrell from somewhere. But I mean, there's so much running around. There's so many features and products and ideas that I want to build and trying to be focused, making sure that I'm focused purely on what is going to move the needle most right now. Right. Again, I'm the chief offender there and have surrounded myself with extremely talented people who are able to help create sanity out of the chaos of, here's a great idea. Here's a great idea. We could do this. This is a trillion dollar idea and make sure that I, I write those down and I chew on them, but I don't let those become distractions for me or the team. And I would love to spend all day designing GIFs and like animations because it's really fun for me to do. I've got a great idea for like an upvote animation, not a great use of my time, not the most important thing right now. So being aware that my job is changing and that I need to give away my Legos to trust other people who can do those things better and also focus on the things that really matter the most. Yeah, that's really well said. It sounds like this is something you've clearly thought about, worked on a lot, and I'm guessing you've had coaches or other figures that have helped you with. I have a great coach and clearly have gotten a lot of feedback from other teammates. Yeah, well, and I empathize because that's uh, I think I'm wired very similarly. I'm curious, and I'll ask both these questions at once. We kind of separate them out, but for some people, one resonates, maybe the other typically doesn't. But you know, if you think about either critical figures in your life, and these could either be historical figures that you just looked up to, you read about, you just really admired, could be figures that you have close to you, or it could be books. Like, are there figures, historical, personal books that have had an influence on you? And what's that influence? And what would you recommend to others? I have to give a shout out to my parents. Obviously, they're the ones who wouldn't be here without them giving me sort of all the opportunity in the world. And Definitely non-traditional parenting, probably, but it set me up really for success. And they did an incredible job in terms of giving me the freedom and the leeway to do whatever I wanted. And as long as I did it with all of my best effort and ability, they're fully supportive. Let's see, historical figures, modern. This one is a, I think Elon is a very polarizing figure that I think is fascinating because he is someone who has had all of these very big swing ideas. And has been able to execute on things that really move the needle. I also think there's probably room for improvement in how he communicates them and how he shares them. I think taking really big bets, despite how challenging they are, if they're going to try to change the world and improve, again, these cliche sort of really make the world and not even this world, other worlds a better place. One book that I loved is Finite and Infinite Games. And I was talking about this this weekend. There's a movie called Arrival that on the surface is about aliens, but it's about so much more. It's about basically the idea of our concept of time and the, the nature of life where let's say you knew in advance that you, I don't want to add any spoilers, but you knew in advance how challenging a startup would be. It might not work, but over the course of that journey, you are going to impact so many different people and improve people's lives. Would you still do it? Is it worth it? Right. If you could see how your life was going to play out, what would you change? What would you do the same in terms of minimizing those regrets? As a politics junkie, I'll avoid getting too deep into politics, but there are definitely certain politicians and presidents that I think have 
had a profound impact on changing things for the better. I think Obama, for a lot of the flack that he gets, did an incredible job trying to change healthcare. It was a massive challenge. And surely there's a lot more room to improve it. But things like that, taking big bets that move the needle, to me, and that's on both sides of the aisle. I believe the same thing. I'm pretty much right down the middle. But I think those are things that I get really excited about. That's what gets me fired up to do all the hard work is to really try to improve and change things is exciting. So, And I love that through line of just really admiring and appreciating people. Maybe just appreciating the best word, appreciating people that can take big bets, especially in public, because I think that all of us have ideas that we think are profound or have visions of ourselves and what we can do that excite us, or at least most of us do. But I think to do those in public, to get all the flack for them, to have people pile on with kind of negativity and hot takes when you're still executing on it and to persist through it and to continue to build stuff, I think is really, really impressive and is an underrated skill in some ways. We always ask the same two closing questions, and I'm really excited to hear your answers to these. The first one is, if you can share a favorite failure and you can take that any direction that you want, I think something that maybe from the outside looking in probably wasn't a success, but for you was a huge success for one reason or another. Honestly, a lot of my best failures have been jobs that I didn't get, which at the time felt crippling and like, oh my gosh, my career is over. From going to medical school or getting a job on Capitol Hill, I can point to so many different jobs that I were like, this is my dream job. If I get this job, I'm set for life and didn't get those jobs, didn't get a job working on in politics. And it opened the door in hindsight for me I've been rejected constantly from both fundraising, career-wise. I actually, when I was at Google, all I wanted to do was work at Google Ventures. I would interview constantly, would try to position myself, thought it was the coolest, best job I would ever have. And I just didn't have what it took and never was able to really get past the interview stage, probably deservedly so. But that ticked this fire in me. Well, you know what? Maybe they're right. I haven't proved myself. I need to build something. And so I started building little venture websites. And then all of that snowballed into what's now common stock. And so getting rejected by Google Ventures, getting rejected by every other VC firm that I wanted to work for, I was like, all right, you know what? Screw them. I'm just going to go build something myself and they're going to have to give me their money. (laughs) And then we'll see who gets the last laugh. And I'm petty like that. And so (laughs) it's turned out to work okay so far. Yeah, we all have that side. And it prevented you from being a boring venture capitalist. So that's the upside. (laughs) And then, you know, on the flip side, we always ask people this question, what is your definition of success? When you think about it in kind of totality, kind of zooming out from just what you're building. My definition of success is, I think I touched on this earlier, impacting as many people as possible in the biggest way possible that I possibly can. And I think that is just what gets me fired up to go to work every day is can you, whether it's improving one person's life on a daily basis or hundreds or thousands or millions, that is something to me that's money and physical things are just not exciting. And I know that sounds super cliche. I bought a used car last year and it's exciting for like the first week or month, but no matter what, those things are going to get old. It never gets old hearing like, hey, you helped me improve my knowledge or you helped me improve my portfolio or make more money or you helped me buy a house. And like, even if common stock doesn't become financially rewarding for me or our investors, same thing with our team. Helping our team, there are a group of people who have rerouted their lives to join this crazy mission and will do literally anything it takes to help improve their knowledge, to help improve their lives, to make sure that they're looked after, right? And have a good positive impact on their lives, have a good positive impact on our users, ideally on our investors as well, and the people who invest in our investors. I think that's the scalability, like the exponential potential for impact to me is why I love startups is there's the chance for me to create and have almost exponentially increasing impact on people that is really challenging, but very rewarding. And that's how I kind of measure 
success is the number of people that I can positively impact. And it might be a few people, might be millions, hopefully by the end of the day, but that's what I love doing. I think you're at the right place, right time with Common Stock, and I love what you're building. Thank you so much for all the time. This has been just one of the best interviews. So I really appreciate it, David. Well, likewise, as you can tell, I love rambling about this stuff because I get so excited. But thanks for having me. Great to jam. Happy to chat anytime. If you haven't yet, listen to David McDonald's deep dive interview on Common Stock in episode 44. For links to everything we discussed, as well as our notes and takeaways from this episode, visit outlieracademy.com slash 44. There you can also find more incredible interviews with guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, and the founders of Titan, Rally, Premal Kitchen, and so many other great companies. There you can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Outlier Debrief, where every Friday we share a few highlights from the latest episode, as well as our favorite articles, headlines, and moments from that week. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.